Hey everybody, welcome to WOW Live. Yes, Word on Wednesday Live. Here we are, the first of five lessons in December. You know, who knew there was so much info on giants in the Bible? You know, we're finding out a good bit of stuff. Hey, maybe if you, if you didn't know about it, uh, there was a little pre-show thing a few minutes ago that I did because uh, I always want to test the uh, waters a little bit make sure the live stream is working and everything and so uh, if you get a chance go back and and, and check it out I, I'm thinking about using that uh, test as to be more than just throwing something up there for a minute or so and then having it go away maybe there'll be something I can put on there little tidbits here and there that kind of thing each week so anyway something to think about and you can take a look at it let me know what you think um, anyway uh, who knew there was going to be this much information I thought I'd begin today by showing you in a few moments a uh, series of ancient uh, stone reliefs done into walls or sides of buildings or anything like that in ancient structures and some paintings and everything and in there there seem to be these representation of giants larger people than the other people that are in the uh, scene that is being portrayed now one could make the argument I suppose that the bigger individuals in these artistic representations are the more important members of the society you know they are bigger people in the community so they're bigger people on uh, the stone <laughs> when they're carved in and so that's why they're so big now I'm no anthropology expert by any means I'm not sure I do also know that the experts who interpret these relics are guessing things at a distance you know they're making an educated guess and those guesses are probably pretty good guess might be a kind of a weak word they're making a hypothesis uh, you know but they'll say things like we know that this is the way it was and some of the things they're probably right about but there's probably some other things that they think they're right about and might not be you know and you can't really ask anybody because there's nobody left that used to live there so you don't really have a a, a live kind of context you're, you're just uh, putting some puzzle pieces together and making an educated guess, like I said, uh, on what the, the objects mean and everything, these, these relics and, and everything. So perhaps the bigger people in these images are the more important people in the community or whatever. But on the other hand, if there really were clans of people, tribes of people, genetically, uh, physically larger in size than the rest of the population. It also stands to reason that, that those individuals could also be the most important people in that culture just by virtue of them being bigger than everybody else in town. And to prove my point a little bit, um, I can bring up uh, uh, King Saul. Israel chose King Saul as their Saul as their first king. Okay, God didn't choose him. The people wanted a king, and this is the guy they chose. And one of the reasons they chose him, he was a head taller than everybody else, all the other men. He's bigger, so obviously he's going to be more important. So anyway, in my humble opinion, the big people in these images you're about to see could very well represent people who were important in the community and who were actually as well physically large. They were giants, okay? So let's take a look at some of this stuff here. Uh, this first one that we're looking at here. Uh, I'm fairly certain this image is from ancient Sumer. Land that stretched from north of Canaan, north of Israel basically, the promised land, and ran toward the southeast through the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley, Mesopotamia, Sumer, right? It looks uh, in this relief as though one poor fellow has been impaled in the throat by a spear-like weapon there. 
Um, you know, I guess I'll have to get a different rating on these Bible studies with the violence we're seeing here. He's he's stabbed in the throat, and and, and it's similar to the, it's the the same kind of weapon basically that the big guy, the giant guy, is holding in his right hand there. So he's the perpetrator, obviously, of this dastardly deed. And the other people are uh, shorter people are looking around at this giant, and they're fearful. They're afraid of what he's going to do. Looks like one guy already paid the price. The giant's foot is kind of stepping on him there or something. So a uh, very interesting uh, piece of artwork there. And here's a Sumerian giant slash god. He's sitting on a throne there. He has some uh, lowly priests before him there who are in obeisance. They're worshiping him and, and so forth. And so uh, giant representation there. Here we see, whoops, we see too far. Let's go back a little bit. Here we see a line of regularly sized individuals. You know, everybody's about, you know, five foot nine or something. They're all the same, uh, except the guy at the end with the pointed hat. I thought, like, is he a garden gnome? I, I wasn't sure what he was doing there. Then I thought, maybe wizard, you know, pointed hat. Looks like he might have a beard on there. I can't really see it from here very well. Maybe you can see it better on your larger screen. Um, and it, uh, you know, but he could be a dunce too, so I'm not sure. Uh, Tin Man, maybe that's the funnel cap, you know, I, I don't know. Anyhow, but then you see these other giant people coming in from the left there, stage left, right? And uh, so this, they're more elegantly dressed and everything. They're more important people and they're bigger people. Uh, this was found in Iran, uh, which in ancient times was known as Persia. So, all right, let's take a look. Obviously, some Egyptian things coming up here. Now, who knows what's really going on here? This is definitely different. Looks like a big guy is laying down a blessing on a smaller guy by tapping his head with what looks to be a large incandescent light bulb to me. I mean, it's just a real long tube kind of light bulb. Maybe he gets a radio signal with that. I don't know if they have several of them. Um, it looks like it's got a serpent for a filament in there to glow and everything. That's And there's even a power cord coming out the back end of it there, down at the base. You see where there's a cord running across there, and it's connected to a box over there, which obviously is some kind of a, 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 a transformer step-down thing, or it's a battery a power pack, a power unit uh, that's, that's making the bulb glow there. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, maybe the, the serpent is an electric eel. <laughs> okay, that was kind of stupid. A third guy... It, it, who's the smallest of the group there, he's helping to hold the light bulb at the heavy end so it doesn't, well, maybe not the heavy end, but the bulky end, so it doesn't drop and shatter all over the, the guy's head there. And I'm not sure what's sitting atop the smallest guy's head. I don't know if it's an egg, a nut, um, you know, not sure what, what's their thought balloon. He's, he's, they were going to put something in there, but it was too small to write what he was thinking. I don't know, something. Anyway, now, in this Egyptian relief painting, we see a giant guy. He's holding three captives by the hair. I'm not sure what he has in his left hand there. He might be a giant barber. He's preparing to cut the hair. And two of the captives seem to be holding up their hands in a kind of pleading way as if to say, no, no, please don't do this. So maybe he's a bad barber. I don't know. It doesn't look like the big fellow is moved with any kind of compassion or mercy for these guys. He's going to go through with whatever he's planning to go through with. So there it is. And in this final slide of giants and small people from ancient times, we see a carving from the Mayan civilization in Central America. Now, I think they call it Mesoamerica nowadays, but, you know, I'm still old school. I don't know why they change these things. They teach you. This is called Central America, and then they go and change it. You know, it's not called that anymore, so just to make you look stupid or something. Anyway, in a very ornate design, a large man is receiving homage from two smaller individuals. You see them kneeling on their knees before him here. And obviously he's bigger. Look at the size of his head compared to theirs, right? Um, I, I wanted you to see uh, that the idea of giant people is not exclusive to the Bible, nor is it exclusive to the ancient Near East around Israel and Canaan and so forth and into Egypt and then through Mesopotamia. It's not just there. In fact, I want you to understand, what I want you to understand is that the idea that there have been giant clans in the past 
is not something found just in the Bible. It's found throughout cultures around the world, including uh, the First Nation culture, uh, First Nations cultures in our own country, in America. The, the, the Native Americans tell stories of giant people who were several heads taller than them, white skin, red haired. And they were here, according to some of the legends, before the Indians ever arrived. That's fascinating to me. Fascinating to me. So interesting information. Something to just tuck away. Now, for a quick review of our Bible study, what we've seen so far, not, not as much as we did last time, but we have some, some, seen some evidence for the existence of giants coming to us from the New Testament writings of Peter and Jude, the angels who did not keep their proper domain uh, but left their own abode. They crossed a boundary, says Jude. God, Peter says, did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to Tartarus, the lowest point of hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And it says, he goes on to say, it did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people. So he ties, seems to tie that angelic story right in with the flood story, which is what you see back in Genesis chapter 6. We've, of course, noted the existence of Goliath, right? Uh, the big guy, 10 feet tall there, likely. David took him out. Uh, Saul wouldn't do it, by the way. Might have been a head taller, but he wasn't going out there. Uh, anyway, we have talked also about how during the time of Israel's bondage in Egypt, giant clans arose within and flourished for 400 years within the borders of Canaan, the land promised to Abraham and his descendants. The Israelites were gone down into Egypt for 400 years, and these people took over the land. And we saw the children of Israel balk at the notion that they could conquer these giants who had taken possession of their land, and so they rebelled against God. God promised this land to, to, to Abraham's descendants. He promised it to the Israelites, delivered them to get them back into their land as a nation of people. And when they get to the border, we can't do it. And they, no matter what Joshua and Caleb said, in fact, they wanted to stone those guys. So no wonder God got, a, got, got angry with them and decided to uh, condemn them to a, a year, 40 years of wandering before their children would move in and take the land under Joshua. Anyway, and we have also talked about the origin of giants, right? From Genesis chapter 6, uh, giants on earth before the time of the great flood judgment. When angels departed their heavenly abode, as Jude said, and they took human women as wives, and they had children by them. And those offspring were the Nephilim, the giants, the gigantes, the mighty men of old, the men of renown. Mighty men, by the way, is a Hebrew word, gibberim, and it appears later in scripture too. But these guys, probably men of renown, sort of tells us they might be the basis for mythology uh, in the, the Greek myth, myths and so forth. Think Hercules and some of the other demigods that uh, come from Greek and Roman times and other places as well. Um, anyway, and then last week, we went back in history before that time, before the time of the flood and before the angels rebelled, when the fallen Lucifer, the original rebel angel, convinced the man and the woman in the garden that they could become like gods. They could know good and evil for themselves. They didn't need God telling them what good and evil meant. I explained to you, um, whoops, there we go explained to you last time that this idea that we could become gods, and there's a fancy word for this called apotheosis, ascending into godhood. Look up, if you, if you have time on your computer and remember this, look up the apotheosis of George Washington. Apotheosis, it's not too hard to, it sounds like a difficult word to spell, but not really. It's A-P-O, that's apo, and then theos is T-H-E-O-S-I-S, -S, theosis apotheosis of George Washington and see where that what where that takes you what 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 image you might see when you look up the apotheosis of George Washington ascent into godhood this is the lie the lie of satan you will be like god knowing good and evil 
And Satan, in the midst of his own deception, he declared, I will be like the Most High God. I'll be like the Most High God, and that got him cast out of heaven. But he still believes he can do that. I'm convinced of that. That's his motivation. When the deceiver in Eden was cursed by God, God told him, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, in this, in this curse, he says, I, God says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, that's the very first prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, one born of a woman without any help from, with a man. You know, it's the seed of a woman. So there's virgin birth implied here. And, and he's going to come and, and bruise the head, crush the head of the serpent. But in the process, his own heel will be bruised. If you will, this verse is the very first Christmas verse in the Bible. It's the first prophecy of the gospel, okay? Because of this verse... And that when what it means, and what Satan, how he interpreted it, and how he took it, and what he did with it, because of that, I believe that the incursion of rebellious angels among the population of Earth to produce angelic and human hybrids, those Nephilim, those giants, I believe that was a deliberate effort, all right, for carrying out a satanically designed plot by supernatural evil, in an attempt to prevent the Messiah, the seed of the human woman, from coming. It's kind of, we looked at the, the Grinch as just a, a, an example, you know, I must stop Christmas from coming, but how, you know? And this was how uh, Satan elected to try to keep Christmas, to try to keep Christ from coming, uh, by corrupting human seed. Okay, so that was the brunt of last week. The question comes to mind, did Satan fully understand the true nature of this coming seed of the woman? Did he get the whole thing or what? In other words, what did Satan know and when did he know it, right? That's the mystery for us here. We're not really sure. To begin with, that God would use the phrase seed of the woman rather than the seed of a man, that ought to have caught Satan's ear. I mean, he's not stupid. He knows what's going on to produce children. He gets it. He understands what's happening in the creation that God made here on earth, all right? And we look back in hindsight. We can see that connection of the phrase, seed of the woman. We see the connection to the virgin birth of the Messiah Jesus, as we just talked about. Before that fact was obvious, before the Messiah actually came, would Satan have considered uh, the seed of the woman to be a reference to virgin birth. Would he have thought of that? We can't know that for certain. Satan's a pretty bright fellow, even though he's evil. He, we, we suppose it's possible he might have known. What else might Satan have known? What else might he have considered? His own destruction at the feet of this seed of the woman, clearly stated in the prophecy, your head's going to be crushed. We know what that means for a snake. You know, if you're going to stomp on a snake, if that's the only way you got to kill one, and you hopefully have some good boots or better sandals than what I'm seeing there, you have a chance of crushing the head of the snake. Uh, what would therefore undo what had been done by Satan upon these two human beings? What would it cause? Because uh, you know he's he's going to be destroyed for this. What what would what would have to happen to really crush his head? See, is what I'm kind of asking. Uh, did Satan have any clues about that? And then there's also part of that prophecy where the seed of the woman was at the very least going to be injured in some way. Satan was told, you shall bruise his heel. And if you look a little closely at the heel uh, in back there, this, it's kind of pinkish, like there might be an infection going on there. So that's what the artist put in there. Um, you shall bruise his heel, Satan was told. In the natural order of things, a serpent's or snake's bite upon the heel of a human being down there at the level where a snake would be crawling on its belly, that would injure the man, causing him to bleed. All right. Again, we can only speculate, but it seems reasonable enough that Satan might possibly make that connection. He's going to bleed a little bit. 
All right. There's other things here, see. When the man and the woman sinned, they immediately saw that they were naked. They figured that out immediately, and so they sought to cover themselves. And they made coverings by stitching fig leaves together. This was human effort to try to make a covering for sin. And instead of the leaves, God took an animal and sacrificed it, making garments for them out of the animal's skin. Just check out Eve's uh, distraught look on her face of the awfulness of what had to happen for her to have a garment to wear. We look back at that. Clearly, we see pictured the shedding of blood has to happen in order for sin to be covered. Seems to be a law. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. God himself initiates this act. He's the one who puts the animals to death and slays them and prepares the coverings for them. So it seems that this law of the need for shed blood to cover sin. This has been exemplified by God. He has carried it out like a high priest would do. All right? A sacrifice. Human efforts to make coverings for our sin, that's not going to work. It's something God himself has to do. Again, how much of this did Satan understand? That's what we're trying to focus on here. We're telling the story and, and then putting Satan in there as the observer. What is it he getting out of this? How much is he getting? What did he know? When did he know it? In Genesis chapter 4, we learn that God respected Abel's sacrifice coming from among the animals which he tended, okay, and we assume he therefore made a blood sacrifice. It doesn't say that specifically, but it seems to be he got the idea from his parents probably that a blood sacrifice is what is required. And so as a, as a tender of animals, a keeper of animals, he puts an animal to death. Cain, his brother, was a tiller of the ground, a grower of plants. Now the ground has been cursed it takes hard work to produce plants now, okay? Harder than what Adam had it to begin with, okay? And so he's growing plants by hard work. And God did not respect Cain's offering. Now, connecting his offering to the fig trees, uh, fig leaves covering of Genesis 3, we can see human effort, not enough to deal with sin. Something coming up directly out of the ground is the cursed ground. It's sort of like using a direct product of the curse itself to try to undo the curse. And that seem, doesn't seem to be working. That's not good enough, if you can think of it in those terms. We're told that Cain is angry that his sacrifice is rejected by God. All right? He had put a lot of sweat into his garden. All right? Genesis 4, 6, and 7 says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? You know what the problem is. Verse 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? The assumption behind that is that Cain does know what doing well would be. He has to make a blood sacrifice. Why couldn't he swap a whole mess of corn for an animal that he could sacrifice from his brother. I'm sure his brother would give him a good one, right? You know, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if, you know, he's being held accountable for what he did, all right? So he had knowledge. Knowledge means you know, you know. Uh, you, you Being accountable means you know something is required and you're not meeting it, okay? Uh, or at least you will be required to meet it. Uh, because you know, you know the truth. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, but if you know the law, it's even less of an excuse, right? And he goes on to say, God says, if you do not do well, Cain, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you shall not rule over it. Sin lies at the door. That's like a serpent lying in wait for Cain, coiled up at the doorway, ready to strike. Sin desires to have him and to destroy him. And so we see in verse 8 that works. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. He killed his brother. Think about that. We know the story. Think about it. Killed his own brother. Cain shed the blood of his brother 
Abel. It is almost as though Cain understood a blood sacrifice was needed to deal with sin. All right? His parents would have told Abel and him what God had done to replace the unacceptable covering that they had made out of fig leaves. He sacrificed animals. They would have told their sons that undoubtedly. Cain would also have known that God promised the seed of the woman would come to destroy what the serpent had caused to bring all this pain and anguish and effort and sweat about. Perhaps Abel was the seed of the woman. I don't know if Cain was thinking that or not. Maybe my brother Abel is the seed of the woman. Maybe if I shed Abel's blood, all this will stop. I'll save the family, you know, I'll save, you know, and things will be reversed. This curse can be reversed if human blood is shed and Abel seems to be the one who's best on God's side, I'll sacrifice him. He's the best one. I don't know. It doesn't say that in the text, but it makes a certain kind of sense to me that maybe that's what he was thinking. And again, how much of this did Satan understand or think or consider? In fact, how much was he actually involved? He was the one waiting at the door to strike. Now note what God said to Cain. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, that cursed ground. His blood is crying out to me from that. So now you are cursed from the ground, from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Wow. You know, the, the earth is soaking up the blood. That cursed ground is taking your brother's blood into it. And it's crying out to me. No doubt Satan heard or at least heard about what the Creator had just said here. Remember, Satan has one mission at this time, to prevent the coming of the seed of the woman. He is therefore monitoring to be sure what God says, what God does, all of it very carefully, looking for hints and clues. If he can't be on the scene, he's got other minions working with him to do it. And here, God listens to the voice of Abel's blood spilled from the ground and soaking into it. God is aware of the shedding of human blood. So, when putting all this together, the injury that will happen to the seed of the woman, the need for the shedding of blood to deal with sin, the destroying of Satan and his work by the seed of the woman, the God taking note of shed human blood, uh, it's hard to ignore the obvious point that human blood will be needed to take care of human sin. Therefore, corrupt the human bloodline completely. Corrupt it completely, and the seed of the woman cannot come. There will be no humans. We'll corrupt it with angel blood, so to speak. I don't know if angels have blood, but there's going to be a crossing over, a mixture here, a hybridization. So, that's what I believe happened. Now, here is one that Satan perhaps did not see. There's another prophecy, actually, in early Genesis concerning the coming of this seed of the woman. And this prophecy is found somewhat hidden in Genesis chapter 5. Let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says there, um, that this is the first five verses. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. So genealogy is going to happen here. There's a genealogy in this chapter. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, two genders, and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years, and begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. That wasn't originally what was supposed to happen, but because of sin, Adam has now died. Seth's name means appointed. 
Well, we see that actually uh, a, a few verses back in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, where it says, And Adam, uh, which means man, knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Okay, so that's the name. Her new son is called Seth, and that means appointed. For God's appointed another seed for me instead of Abel. Not surprisingly, of course, Adam's name means man. While we're talking about meanings of names, at the end of Genesis chapter 5, we learn that Noah's name means comfort. Genesis 5, verses 28 and 29. Lamech lived, Lamech is Noah's daddy, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So comfort is going to come through Noah, having something to do with providing comfort to human beings. Comfort from man's curse of hard work and toil and resolving what's going on with this curse of the ground. This ties in so very closely with the work of the seed of the woman prophesied in Genesis 3.15, who will undo the work of the serpent, which led to the very curse that Lamech is talking about. Uh, all very interesting. Noah plays a key role in all of this. That's an important point to make here for this chapter. The entirety of Genesis chapter 5 here is a genealogy of Adam through Seth all the way down to Noah. There are 10 names in total in this chapter which make up this genealogy. So without reading to you the entire chapter, here are the names. And you might make note that Enoch is indeed the seventh one from Adam down. Just as Jude had said in his little book, which we saw clear back in, in lesson one. Here's a chance to see it. We have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, uh, more properly Canaan with a K, all right, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Now, each one of those names has a meaning. We have seen that Adam means man, Seth means appointed, and Noah means comfort. Enosh, let's look at that, Enosh means mortal. Now, the Hebrew, Hebrew word Enosh is often translated as the, the English word man uh, in English versions, but it, it's general generally is a man with an emphasis upon man's mortality all right it's it's the the end of a man that it, it, the man is not quite measuring up man is dying he doesn't have long to live those kind of verses where man is used it's usually enosh kenneth a matthew says in the new american commentary on this passage though the etymology the, the word history of hebrew enosh is uncertain its usage often refers to the frailty and the insignificance of man perhaps seth seth's naming of enosh reflects his own sense of mortality and in light of the murder of abel his older brother the tenuous character of human life Wow, it can, can be gone in an instant. And so we really are mortal, frail people. And so uh, Enosh gets his name. Enosh means mortal. Now the name of his son, Canaan, more accurately rendered, as I said, with a K, Canaan, it means a dirge, a, a, a funeral song, a lament. This, is, this uh, uh, quote here is from the Aberim Publications online Biblical Name Vault and in the article that uh, talks about Canaan there, the name of Canaan. It's a noun, kina, which denotes a kind of sad poem, a dirge or a lamentation, sadness, uh, which both had to be fabricated and could presumably pierce a person's soul like a spear which is an obvious biblical figure of speech. See Luke 2.35. That's where Simeon, the old man who sees Mary with the, the, the baby Jesus in the temple, says to her, a sword shall pierce your soul, shall pierce your heart. Um, and and uh, sadness is coming to you. 
is what he's saying. Anyway, uh, this fellow goes on, the denominative verb conan means to do a dirge, to do a dirge, to actually sing it. Could either be to chant it or to compose one, to put one together. So it's dirge lament, it's sadness. We can say that a sad dirge, a, a funeral song lamenting the death of a loved one, uh, represents sorrow. So Canaan, therefore, means sorrow. Canaan's son was Mahalalel. Mahalalel, I like saying that. It takes a little practice, but Mahalalel, his name means the blessed God. Mahalal, the first part of it, is a root word meaning praise, and then L, the ending, is God. I should have an E-L there, not an A-L. Just notice that on the slide. Down at the bottom, I do have it right. So forgive me for that. But you can see hints there of the word hallelujah in the name of Mahalalel the blessed God. So his name means that. The name of Jared, uh, Mahalalel's son, means to come down. Um, uh, almost sounds like the price is right long ago. So and so, come on down. So Jared, come on down. Anyway, the Hebrew is Garad, and it means to go down or to descend, okay? A concise dictionary of the words in the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Bible how does that be concise when the title's so long? I don't know. But anyway, it defines yarad as to descend, literally to go downwards, or conventionally to a lower region as to the shore, a boundary, the enemy, etc. So Jared, yarad, go down. Okay, come down. And Jared's son is the one who is the seventh from Adam. Uh, Enoch, right, as the book of Jude calls him. Uh, Enoch's name is, means to train, to teach. Uh, to train up, to dedicate. Uh, Enoch the seventh from Adam. Enoch's son is named Methuselah. That's a fun name. Methuselah, a name from two root words. The first part can be either mat, M-A-T, uh, or, or, uh, which is another word for man, or it could be mut, which means death. And maybe t the two together in some way. The second root, shalak, means to send or to let go. Okay? Uh, since the word used for man is also linked to the word meaning death, we can also see that that part of the name means the man who kills, uh, or uh, in other words, a warrior, brings death, in other words. Since shalak means to send, we have a man who is sending death, or as it is understood in the culture of ancient times, a man of the javelin, a man of the spear, okay? Methuselah can therefore mean when he dies, it shall be sent. Death shall be sent. When he dies, it shall be sent. Methuselah, according to the biblical record, lived longer than anyone else, right? Total of 969 years. And in the year that he died, that's when the same year that the great flood judgment began on earth. When he dies, the flood shall come. That's what Enoch named him, prophesying this coming judgment. See, when he dies, it shall come. Methuselah's length of years, being longer than anybody else's, therefore speaks of God's long-suffering, of his mercy, granting time to repent. No one did, but he, he stretched it out long. Methuselah, his, name, his death shall send. Methuselah's son has the name of Lamech. From Aberim Publications Dictionary, again, we read, the particle, le, means to or onto, and may describe a physical motion toward. And the verb, muk, to be low, to be depressed, so the verb makak means to descend, to bring low, or to humiliate. These are the senses of the word in different uh, uh, ways in which it's rendered. The roots are rendered in different ways. The verb muk means to bring low in a socioeconomic sense. So the whole name would thus mean for the lowering, for humiliation, or the lowly. The lowly. Lamech means the lowly one, okay? The humiliated, the lowered ones, the lowly. We have seen that Noah is defined in Genesis 5.29 as comfort. The, the dictionary of deities and demons in the Bible says of the name Noah, the etymology of the name Noah has never been satisfactorily explained. It's usually connected with the verb root noah, meaning rest, 
uh, settle down of the ark in Genesis 8-4, where it came to rest, repose, be quiet, after labor in Exodus 20, verse 11, the day of rest there is talked about. And so Noah may mean rest possibly in association with the resting of the ark on the mountains of Ararat after the flood. The root appears in Ak Nahu to rest as in In Inu Tamtu Abubu. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, Ikla, the sea subsided, the flood ceased in the Babylonian account of the flood, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Anyway, if other Near Eastern languages are pointing to resting, and the Bible itself says that Noah shall bring rest or comfort, I feel safe in saying Noah means comfort. It means comfort. So, we have ten names in this genealogy, and knowing that in the Bible the meaning of names is very important, here is the result that we've now compiled. We have Adam meaning man, Seth is appointed. Enosh means mortal. Canaan is sorrow. Mahalalel talks about the blessed God. Jared means to come down. Enoch has to do with teaching. Methuselah, his death shall send or bring. And then Lamech, the lowly. And finally, Noah, meaning comfort. And when you put all that together, the message of Genesis 5 says this, Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall send the lowly comfort. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall send the lowly comfort. Comfort is coming because the blessed God has come down and he's going to die. And that's going to bring comfort to us. Undoing that mortal sorrow to which we have been appointed. Who would have ever imagined that a genealogy from the book of Genesis would have hidden within it the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's absolutely awesome. I mean, you can bet that if Genesis were some kind of concocted document that was written a century or two before Jesus was born by some Jewish rabbis, if Jewish rabbis were writing this, they never would have put that message in there for any reason. Why would they do it? You know, it, it, it makes no sense uh, apart from the idea of understanding that there is one coming who is going to bring comfort by his death to those who have been appointed death themselves amazing. This authenticates the divine origin of the biblical text when something in far back in Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, which are often criticized by modern scholars to say that they're nothing but mere poetry, it takes that text and elevates it and says it prophesies what's going to happen in the New Testament. That's astounding to me. Moreover, here is what we have now gleaned from Genesis chapter 3, through five. We have learned that the serpent would cause an injury to the seed of the woman who was prophesied to come destroy the work of the serpent. That injury or that wound would likely cause bleeding as a snake bite obviously would. We observe the need for the shedding of blood to deal with sin when God made coverings for Adam and Eve from animal skins. Their fig leaf coverings were useless. In Genesis chapter 4, in a story of acceptable and unacceptable sacrifices and the result of a brother therefore killing a brother, we also read about God taking note of shed human blood as Abel's blood cries out to him from the cursed ground. It is hard to ignore the obvious point that human blood is going to be needed to take care of that curse, to take care of human sin. And then we discern from Genesis chapter 5 that because of Genesis chapter 3, man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort. That's absolutely astounding. You know, I don't believe Satan saw the connection in real time as those ten generations of Genesis 5 gradually would have unfolded in actual history over more than 1,500 years. Therefore, he may not have understood the true identity at all, nor the entire message concerning this coming seed of the woman and what actually was going to happen. For him, the whole goal was to keep that seed from coming. That's what he's concerned about, about what he's focused upon. Hence the plan to have angels leave 
leave their domain, come down to earth, take human women as wives, and produce these hybridized giant beings known as the Nephilim. Also, Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. The earth also was corrupt before God. This is all in Genesis chapter 6, the same chapter with the giants and the angels and the women and everything else. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Now, while we don't have the details, consider that there is the obvious objective to completely be redoing what the Creator had made. That's what the objective is, okay, for, for, for uh, Satan to uh, change things so that the, the, the uh, seed of the woman cannot come. And so you read those verses there. The earth is also corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. All flesh had corrupted their way. And you think about it. You have this hybridization, the corrupting of flesh, of human flesh, corrupted resulting in those giants. And you have this reference that, therefore, the earth was filled with violence. You know, you start to wonder if there was some kind of a genocide underway here. That, that this co the corrupting of the flesh wasn't happening fast enough, and so we have to exterminate any human beings who are still fully human. There's violence going on, and so there's this genocide, possibly. I mean, I'm just speculating here, but it, it seems to be talking about the violence. What causes the violence? The wiping out of pure human beings, the pure human race. Remember, we had read this verse in verse 9 before regarding Noah. I also have thrown in verse 10 here. So these are the verses, 9 and 10, right before 11 and 12, which we just looked at, the earth being filled with violence, corrupting of the flesh, corrupting its way, and so forth. So these are the verses right before those. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah is perfect in his generations. The word translated genealogy there in verse uh, 9 is essentially the same as the word translated generations. So they're basically the same word. You see, this has to do with the bloodline, genealogy, generations. He's perfect in his genealogy. Is this saying Noah had a perfect or a complete, fully human bloodline with no intermixing with the angelic race? Under the context with Genesis chapter 6, the first four verses, and then this down in verses 9 and 10, that's a very legitimate way of translating this passage. You know, we say things today in our church lingo, things that, that we don't want to, like we don't want to be corrupted by worldliness, right? We don't want the world system around us impacting us and changing us, nor do we want to see our children corrupted by the spiritual vacuum that's in the modern world. We hope that they get some spiritual sense out of all this, that there's something greater than just what's on TV or on their phone. What would it be like to live in a world where you would have to protect children and grandchildren from a literal physical corruption. Genetic engineering. Hmm. The word incursion means an invasion or an attack, a sudden one. Authors who study this Genesis 6 subject regularly speak about an angelic incursion that had occurred on earth, an attack when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. There's a deliberate attack here. There was a sudden descent upon the earth to do this thing. By the time Noah was on the scene, how long had it been since the rebellious angelic invaders had arrived? What's the timeline like here? Well, it's interesting taking a look at this uh, graph here, this chart, it's interesting that the fifth man down from, from Adam, Mahalalel, named his son, son Jared, which means to come down, 
to descend from a high place to a low place. Suppose Methuselah, or Methuselah, sorry, Mahalalel, suppose Mahalalel gave Jared his name to take note of when this angelic incursion had happened, when this time that the angels had come down. And he noted that by naming his son according to what was happening. Jared. They came down in the days of Jared. Using just what we see in Genesis chapter 5, at the times and, 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 and ages and, and numbers there, the years that are talked about in that, and nothing else because there's nothing else there. Just using that straight up. Jared was born 460 years after Adam was created. You can see that on the chart. There's a little 460 next to the 162, his age when Enoch was born, Jared's age. So 460 years after Adam was created. And Noah was born 1,056 years after Adam was created. So there's about 600 years of difference between Jared, the time when the angels came down, and the time that Noah is born. And then Noah lived between 500 and 600 years old when the time of the flood judgment began to draw near and to happen. So that makes for an angelic invasion and occupation lasting over a thousand years. The giants would begin to have clans themselves. And I believe there were giant women as well as giant men. Just makes sense. They would begin to have clans themselves. And so you have this growing population of mutants, of hybrids, okay, of chimeras, combining somehow angelic essence and human essence. I also confess, and, and this, folks, is based on pure speculation, okay, that I wonder how far this hybridization program uh, might have gone in that time. How much would they have experimented with things? My thinking meanders on a line like this. You see, Satan desired to be like the Most High God. He wants to be like God. Now, among other distinctives between God and the angels, and there's a lot of distinctives, okay, the dis one distinction that's made very clear in early Genesis, obviously, is that God is the creator, and angels are not. God shows them when he creates the earth. See Job chapter 38, verse 7. When all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, the creation of the earth talked about in those first seven verses. So we have no idea how much angels might know about this created realm around us. They, they didn't do it. How much have they looked into it? How much do they know about the created realm in which we live, this physical world? Okay, we know that when Aaron cast off his staff upon the ground, well, First, let's talk about this image here. We know that the angels in Sodom, they were able to strike the men there with, with blindness. Okay, They had the power to do that, to blind those men, to stop something going on inside their bodies. We also know, talking about Aaron as I was a moment ago, when Aaron cast his staff upon the ground before Pharaoh and it became a serpent, that the magicians of Egypt cast down their staffs, and their staffs also became serpents. And we believe, of course, that was by the power of supernatural evil. That means rebellious angels must know some things about this material world in which we live and how it can be manipulated. Just little insights into that. So that's kind of the ground uh, foundation for this, what I'm going to say now. What then if the rebellious angels, under guidance from Satan and in concert with perhaps other rebellious angels, sought to corrupt the flesh of the animals on earth before the flood? What about possible manipulation of animals at the DNA level? What if they're looking into this idea? How can we mate with human beings? Is there some way we can do that? And maybe they, they're smart, all right? Maybe they do know. Maybe they probably didn't call it DNA. Who knows what they called it? But they understood the basic building block of life. Perhaps if they can cause blindness and change staves into snakes. 
What about experiments in hybridization? What if they did that with animals? You know, it's interesting. Uh, the ancient Greeks told these tales, which includes all kinds of mythological creatures. So there's the centaurs, a mixture of humans and horses. There's the, the minotaur, part man, part bull. There are the satyrs, part human and part goat, and so on. Now, granted, people have uh, delightful imaginations to create all manner of creatures in their minds. That's a wonderful gift the Creator has given us. But what if, just what if, there were some sort of basis, maybe not as developed as these creatures we just looked at, but there were a basis for such myths where there was experimenting with animal DNA and, and human DNA that were once part of the reality before the flood? What if that was hinted at and it survived the flood and fostered these kind of ideas around campfires and in school buildings with teachers teaching young people and so forth. Now, it doesn't have to have been that way. I said this was pure speculation. I'm not saying it has to have been that way. I'm just asking the question, what if it could have been that way? And it makes sense to me. If it were that way, well then folks, I have no problem at all understanding God's grieving heart as described in Genesis chapter 6, grieving over what had become of his creation, over what the introduction of sin into his creation had done, both in the angelic realm and in the human realm. I have no problem understanding why he then sought to preserve, and he did preserve, the complete and perfect land dwellers, still pure, free from any corruption, from his original creation. I'm not talking about genetic corruption or anything like that, of course. They still had corruption of sin, but that's not what I'm talking about here. That they were free from all of that, perfect in their generations, as Noah was, to preserve them from his original creation upon this huge three-story barge that we call Noah's Ark. And, sadly, I definitely can see why he had to scrub the whole planet clean of the genetic corruption of the rest of land-dwelling life through this judgment of the Great Flood. As I said before, it is this angelic incursion that happens before the flood and the, the mating that takes place between angels and humans that rises to the level of that moral question, that moral reason why such a horrendous, total, complete judgment had to happen so that nothing would survive on the other side of the flood. It just makes sense to me. I may not have everything right that I said tonight. Like I said, a, number, a good bit of it speculation. But I certainly think that these ideas are on the right track to explain what happened back in the 1600 years, 1,600 years from the time of the creation until the time of the flood and how the giants came into being, and how significant of a role they played in that time, maybe even participating in the annihilation, the attempted extermination of all purely human stock still left on earth. Well, I hope that helps you to see some more things about these giants, and next time we'll get in on the other side of the flood, see what's going on there, and maybe refer back to this from time to time. It's just too much there going on not to completely let it go altogether this stuff crosses over um, you know the giants um, there were giants in the earth in those days it says in Genesis 6 4 and also after that there were giants in the earth in those days before the flood and also after that after the days of the flood whenever the angels the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. It implies that there may well have been, and probably has been, more incursions than just the one that happened before the flood. And it explains why you have giants in the land in Canaan after the flood. So we'll get into some of that next time. 
God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much for following along and, and listening in on this. I hope you're having as enjoyable a time, half of much as, as much enjoyment as what I'm having uh, presenting this information, this material to you. God bless you. Take care.